it's worth saying uh, we do have a, a very multidisciplinary group and it's been a multidisciplinary group um, for some time now um, and not everybody um, knows about physics and not everybody knows about biology quite a lot of people know about sociology quite a lot of people know about systems some people know about architecture um, and psychology and and we're all sort of learning I think that's 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 what's been exciting about these discussions um, over the last few weeks um, because there is something very exciting particularly when you see a number of academics converge what well, it seems to be converging around a, the same basic principles and um, certainly as far as Peter's concerned the, those principles have revolved around nothing mm -hmm. and 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 John I, I think you're you're um, you're also fairly uh, sympathetic to this idea that nothing well, is very important. Not just sympathetic, everything is nothing and nothing is everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, no, I'm 100% with Peter on that one. Have always been. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and John Torday, who's also uh, just joined us. Um, so, John, if you can just introduce yourself, because we've got a couple of new people here. Good. Um, uh, I'm a professor of pediatrics, obstetrics, and gynecology and evolutionary medicine at UCLA. And I've been writing about cellular evolution for the last uh, 20 plus years. I've published one, over 100 peer reviewed articles in journals and uh, six books, and now a seventh one in the making. So basically, I, I go against the grain. I don't buy Darwinian evolution. I never have. Um, and so my perspective comes from that of a cell physiologist and developmental biologist, basically taking what I learned in grad school um, many moons ago, that uh, cell communication is really the key to embryology and then applying that to phylogeny, to speciation. And so basically it's the same process um, universally in biology. And that allows me, has allowed me to go back in space and time all the way from, uh, so I'm a lung biologist but, um, for funding purposes and I was able to use lung development and phylogeny to work all the way back to the unicellular state and using that as a model system, doing the same for kidneys and brains and skeletal system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my point being that now, instead of looking at evolution from its uh, results, reasoning backwards, which we know is illogical, we have an opportunity to use a network that actually allows for looking at the process in the forward direction. So just briefly, uh, for example, I see the atom and the cell as being homologues. They both come from the same origin in the Big Bang. Peter and I uh, differ on whether the Big Bang is really what you want to hang your hat on. I, I get that, but uh, it works for me. And uh, <laughs> you know, I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay. Now, I, um, John, I was wondering if we could start by uh, just uh, developing these ideas, because we've been talking about periodic tables and the importance of the periodic table for chemistry, the possibility of a periodic table in biology, and even, and the, the, the sort of the uh, more radical step is a, is a periodic table in education. And I just, I, I wonder if I can share my screen because in the Google Doc, which I sent around in, with the invitation, you put this um, diagram, which I found fascinating. Um, and, and I don't know whether you can just sort of explain explain your thinking here, really. Okay. Sure. Okay. Let's see it here. So the whole idea here. So I'm saying I, I published a paper on the periodic table of biology back in 2004 in a throwaway journal, The Scientist, and that's actually this diagram here. But I've basically concluded that everything in uh, uh, so so Mark has counseled me that instead of using the term cosmos, use the term totality. So in the totality of everything that's in existence, it's all about communication. It's really what Alfred North Whitehead was talking about when he said that it's all energy, that matter uh, is really uh, an epiphenomenon of the energy flows. Um, but be that as it may, so it's communication. So um, in what I just explained about the cellular communication, uh, as I'm showing it here, going from uh, the unicellular state um, to the multicellular state through the cell here, isn't it? mechanisms. Yeah. Can yeah. you see my mouse or? Okay. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm moving mine. So. Okay. So, yeah. so this, all of this stuff here is really representing uh, phylogeny or the mechanism of speciation, how we got from, let's go specifically 
invertebrate uh, phylogeny. It's uh, how we got from fish to man. Um, and that is underpinned by the embryonic mechanism of cellular communication, which I'm depicting here. Um, and there are, um, when I did that backward, sort of walking back the evolution of the multicellular state back to the unicellular state, I realized that there are only three elements that were necessary, three principles. One is negative entropy, which is Schrodinger's concept uh, that he introduced in his book in 1944 entitled, What is Life? He said that life is actually negative entropy. It's a ne negative state of, um, of organization, basically. Um, and uh, to support that, chemiosmosis is, a is the most primitive mechanism of bioenergetics. It's basically uh, a, an internal membrane in the cell which aligns ions on either, either side, just like your car battery does. And that creates an, uh, an ionic flow which provides the energetics for remaining in a negative entropic state because normally we're in a positive entropic state and um, heat is being dissipated. But in, uh, in, organ um, in life forms, it's, it doesn't dissipate until we die. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the third element is homeostasis, which holds all of this together. So the force of homeostasis is really ubiquitous in all of um, totality, if, if you will. So whether it be E equals MC squared or sodium plus chlorine equals sodium chloride, or endoderm plus mesoderm plus uh, ectoderm equals an, the offspring. These are all, the equal sign in all of those balanced equations is really homeostasis, which and I may be stating heresy here. I haven't heard too much more back from this, but I think that the homeostatic principle em emerged from the, 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 um, the recoil, the equal and opposite reaction to the Big Bang. There had to have been one, that's Newton's third law of motion, and I, I'm attributing that to homeostasis. So homeostasis is really necessary for all matter in, in the totality, otherwise it would all just be chaotic energy. And um, evolution is at the very bottom, and essentially what evolution does is it allows for the organism to maintain um, its relationship to an ever-changing environment, which is a given. The environment is constantly changing, the organism must change in order to be able to survive or become extinct. Hmm. So here at the top, I'm talking about the periodic table of elements. And um, so I actually, uh, my friend uh, Rich Heiberger who's here on this uh, Zoom call uh, with whom I am trying to write a book uh, oriented towards a, someone in the ninth grade to try and explain all of this stuff to somebody at that level of ed education. Um, the question arose as to why, why it is that there is a hierarchical organization in the periodic table of elements. And I went back, Eric Sherry is, a, a, is a, on the faculty at UCLA and a friend of mine, and he's written, I believe, four books on the uh, periodic table. And in his first book, he explains that the way that stars generate energy is through uh, nucleosynthesis. And that in fact, the, that process starts with hydrogen and ends with the heavier uh, elements. So there is a hierarchical organization that the table of the periodic table of elements is founded on. Um, and in fact, um, so in, and in um, um, Harold Marvitz's book on uh, emergence everywhere, Marvitz was a biochemist who wrote a large number of books on biochemistry. But in one of them, this book on emergence, which I think may have been his last, he talks about the fact that in the primordium, when you had free uh, protons and electrons flying around, uh, as luck would have it, a proton found an electron and they um, gained um, electrochemical balance. And that was the hydrogen atom, the first hydrogen atom. And then that built, that built upon itself. And there was one school of thought that hydrogen, that all elements actually are comp, uh, complexifications of, hydrogen, of the hydrogen atom. That's still obviously a hypothesis, but an interesting one because I found it interesting because it's virtually the same thing I'm saying about this, the unicellular state being giving rise to the complexity of biology. So there is a homology here between the periodic table of elements and the periodic table of opposed periodic table of biology. And then I had the audacity um, um, because Mark and I have been talking about the possibility of a periodic table of education. I started with the premise that, that education really is a derivative of biology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started with the idea that uh, in a, a sentence, uh, a spoke, or a, a written sentence, you have a subject, a verb, and an object. 
and this is uh, the commutative principle because this cannot be um, done in the reverse. It has to be done in this, this prograde direction. And then the subject verb object idea gives rise to uh, f uh, more and more complex, so to phrases, to sentences, paragraphs, um, and, uh, and novels and textbooks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there it seems in my mind to be a homology between this process, which is a self-referential, self-organizing system, and the ones that preceded uh, in the periodic table tables of um, the elements in biology, mm. uh, and that in the aggregate, this process actually is what we consider to be education. Mm. And I gave a whole litany of examples of this. I, the one I really like about uh, the homolo homologies between education and biology, for example, um, is drama um, uh, in the humanities, that, that the key element of drama is the fourth wall. So you have a function of, uh, drama is a function of the fourth wall looking in, in from without and seeing the, the dramatic um, presentation in space and time. Mm. Um, but many other, all of the other humanities, I think, also lend themselves to this, this idea of, oh, I'm sorry, what I neglected to mention was that the key here in the periodic table is it's made up, each element is made up of, um, is displayed as two components. There is the physical appearance of, the, of uh, gold, for example. It's yellow, it's shiny, it's, it's dense. What is its melting point? Da, 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 da. We lost him. Please. To the which was nucleus synthesized by stars, for example. So you have this cross cutting of space and time through this. Oh, we lost you for the last minute. Yeah, we, we, could, you, could you repeat just what you just said? Because you broke up. Oh, sorry. Uh, am I talking too fast or? Anyway. No, 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 it just, the, the internet went um, from your end, I think. You just you're vanished. Yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, gold, my... From gold. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So what I was saying is, so if you, if you focus on the periodic table, each element has two components to it in the table. One is how it appears. And I was talking about gold. Uh, it's yellow, it's uh, shiny, um, it's dense. What is its, um, what is its uh, melting point? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are two components. The, the primary one is how it appears in, sp in, uh, in uh, real time. And that's what's referred to as synchronic. I don't know, do you see my mouse, my cursor? No, I'm uh, sorry, my, are you, are you talking? Just here, I'm up, I'm up at the top. You're up at the top here. The t periodic table of elements. So, so the, okay. the way that the element appears is synchronic. It's in yeah. real, it's in real space time. Yeah. However, the underpinning of that is the number of protons per nucleus, which is the basis yeah. for the okay. uh, periodic table. And that actually cuts across space time and it's diachronic. Mm -hmm. So you have both things happening at the, uh, being represented at the same time. And so you have um, this prop or well, the properties of the elements are displayed in both, in both terms. The same is true in the biologic period periodic table in the sense that you have the phenotypic appearance of the embryo starting with a zygote ending with an out offspring and everything in between and by phylogen phylogenetically you have all this the myriad organisms that populate the earth and but underpinning that is the are these cellular communication mechanisms these are the things that cut across space time because they refer all the way from whatever organism you're looking at all the way back to the origins in the unicellular state. Yeah. It's, it's literally the same as the homolo it's homologous with what happens in the periodic yeah. table. Is, is, it, it, worth, is it worth, if it, is it worth, John, just um, emphasizing this cutting across of time, the importance of history and the embedding of history in these structures? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, so for me, when I came to the realization that ontogeny and phylogeny, so this is Heckel's biogenetic law, which he stated back at the end of the 18th century, but Heckel didn't have the, the scientific uh, capacity to test hypotheses as to whether he was correct. He just described it. But when I realized that the ontogeny and the phylogeny were virtually the same thing, which, you know, and as biologists, we think of them as separate entities at different scales and with different 
um, readout uh, purpose, if you will. Uh, one is understanding how you make structure and function, uh, which is important because that's how I predicated the whole analysis was that, that, that development is the only way we know of in biology to determine how and uh, how structure and function have evolved. But the point I was trying to make is that um, when you, if you were to uh, map ontogeny and phylogeny um, as, as one of a piece and, and eliminated the time scale, in my mind's eye, the matter disappears. All that's left is the energy flow from here to there and everything in between. So it's all about energy flow. Similarly, the periodic table of elements is, uh, is akin to that in the sense that you're seeing the energy flow from the origin in the Big Bang to the various elements and how they distribute throughout the totality. And similarly, I would suggest that education could do the same. You could, you know, there's this guy, Daniel Christian, uh, Christian this uh, Australian historian, uh, a history professor who uh, teaches history from the Big Bang. I mean, that's cool because what he's trying to show is how everything is interconnected uh, in a historic sense. And uh, I actually contributed a paper to the journal uh, that um, uh, the Journal of Big History. Christensen talks about, or Christian talks about what, he, what he's teaching is big history. And I said, yeah, but underpinning that is evolution. So if you were to merge the historic press, um, um, nodes, if you will, the historic um, uh, epochs and processes with the, with the um, evolutionary principle, now you see an integration of the how and why of civilization as, as a complete form, not merely dates and times and economics and whatever, now you understand how the humans, human beings either drove that or were affected by that in a highly interactive and causal way. I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think that education lends itself this, to this kind of um, perspective. So. I wonder if I could ask, uh, Peter and I had a quick chat before this session about the periodic table of elements and where it came from, what it is, why it was important to chemistry. Um, Peter, can you, you say something about that? Yeah, well, I'm just going to say, well, we know about Mendeleev was the one who really um, made it work. There were a few attempts earlier, but uh, I mean, he noticed that, that the, the same properties repeated, roughly a period of eight elements, if you took them in increasing mass. <coughs> and um, nothing like I think only about half the elements have been then discovered, or certainly a lot fewer than we have now. And there were gaps which were filled in later. Mm. And there were also points where the the mass was bigger, uh, and you had to switch. You had to switch a couple round. Um, but I think one of the things about the periodic table of elements is that it's not exactly. It's it's not a sort of cast iron law. Mm. It's really a it, it, there's a lot of variation in it and a lot of especially at the higher levels a lot of it, it doesn't completely repeat the cycle of properties in the way we might think there's just a tendency to do that and, uh, and and the orbitals switch around a lot at the higher levels and so so do change the nature of uh, comparisons and uh, and so on it the periodic table of elements is really something of a mnemonic. Yeah. It's not exactly a cast iron law. Yeah, but the and gaps were important, weren't they? Sorry? The, the gaps were important. The gaps in, were important. In, in his theory, because, because we could fill the gaps. Because we could fill the gaps subsequently, it gave yeah. credence to the model. And, uh, well, it's predictive. Right? Yeah. But, uh, and, and then when a new, completely new set of elements, completely unexpected, were found they could be slotted in and in slot zero the the new the um, noble gases. Hmm. So I mean, is it worth thinking about the gaps in the periodic table of biology? Because that that is again that's the test of its predictive um, nature, isn't it? Um, Can I come in here for a second? I know I'm jumping in in the yeah, central yeah. of this, but um, I'm very interested in what uh, John's been saying here about the um, about the cell cell signaling. Mm -hmm. Are we talking here about um, simple chemical signaling? Are we talking about osmosis? Are we talking about electronic signaling? 
are we talking about electromagnetic? Because when he's going back to the Big Bang, then we're talking about something which is really quite a lot more fundamental than, 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 than the local chemical signaling, I take it. But w w John, what do you mean there by cell-cell signaling in this case? No, I'm sorry, I, I skipped over that part <laughs> in my <laughs> zeal to get to the end. To the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so there are specific um, peptides, uh, small proteins that are secreted by uh, any given cell during embryogenesis, which then bind to a specific receptor like a lock and key uh, kind of scenario. And my going on about the energy, energetics is key, that's key to that because when, this, when the growth factor binds to the surface of the cell through this receptor mediated mechanism, it generates high energy phosphates. So that's why I said that when you el eliminate the appearance, the phenotypic uh, appearance of any given um, uh, embryonic state or uh, phylogenetically relevant, you know, fish or you know, frogs, et cetera, et cetera, what you really end up with is the energy flow. And I think that the energy flow started with the Big Bang. This is merely, biology is a way of allowing for that energy flow to persist. Yeah, I, I think, I think you, you, you're right. There must be much more, I mean, a lock and a key thing is quite simple. You have a, a shape of, of molecules and you have molecular information there must be quite a lot more to it than that i mean if you think just about the sense of smell it's far more complex and has far more complexity than one could get simply from the lock and key idea merely but uh, but but also if we're talking about some sort of communication across space and time and through the universe as well we're not talking about peptides moving around there's more to it than that right sure i'm, I'm saying that the yeah no 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 i mean in, in one sense it's still it's organic rather than inorganic life. But at the same time, the means of communication are these high energy phosphates. So there are two classes. Uh, one are the uh, adenosine monophosphates, cyclonucleotides, which were discovered by Earl Sutherland back in the late 60s, which he won the Nobel Prize for. And subsequently, there was a whole, um, there are inositol as a sugar, and when it's phosphorylated, it can be either inositol phosphate it's per se or uh, multiples of that up to inositol phosphate 4. And de depending upon which signal you're getting uh, into the nucleus and affecting DNA polymerase, you'll get a certain readout. It'll either be generally either growth or differentiation. You don't get both at the same time. It's mm -hmm. one or the other. But yeah. that leapfrogging mechanism that I'm depicting here in embryo, well, in embryogenesis is what is the consequence of that. Okay, but, but I'm thinking about going to the, to, to the more fundamental energy flow here in terms of this process by which energy is moving through this whole system. For example, the direction of time itself in terms of, uh, in terms of the balance that exists across the universe in terms of keeping the universe at zero energy, for example, as Peter and I would look at it. Uh, I'm interested in how that energy flow works through all of these systems and, and not only in the periodic table of biology or the elements or education, but also going up and down from there as well. Yeah. yeah. Thinking about thinking about nucleons themselves and subnucleons and, and photons in one direction further up. And, and then if you like further down the page as well, I'd like to go to, um, well, not just, not, not just education, but the, the planet seen as a whole, as a whole thing and then going out to the solar system and eventually the galaxy and the, and the universe as well. So sort of like three or four more, two above and two below on this thing as well, all of which are intermediated through energy flows, through energy flows intermediated in, di intermediated in different ways. But those elements, those different energy flows have very big similarities. They're all governed by the same, we might say at the moment, quantum mechanical, but we whatever the fundamental theories are, by the same fundamental theories, which are in very many cases scalable. So the electromagnetic system scales from incredibly small, as far as we know, right up to absolutely universal size, seamlessly, in that there's, there's, um, the, the, there's no difference between a gamma ray photon or a radio wave photon, as far as we know, except in their energy, the amount of energy they're carrying. So, uh, and it goes further than that as well in principle, up to much higher energies and much lower energies still. So, uh, I mean, for me also in biology and what, what I've looked at in biology, there's more going on than just the chemistry of it, the lock and key part of it, I would have thought. Would you agree with that? Well, so what I said to Mark was that um, actually there was no, so in Bohm's terms of implicate and explicate, 
orders. Yeah. Yeah. There was no expurgate order until the formation of the first cell. So that's a key element in what we're, t we're talking about here, I think. In yeah, the I sense think that right. you have inside and outside, yeah. and you have two different states of entropy. Um, yeah. But beyond that, so the way that the, uh, the neg negative entropy state of the unicell appears, and, and unicells dominate, had dominated the Earth for the first three and a half billion years. It's only in the last 500 million years that they yeah. evolved into multicellular organisms. Yeah, but right. so, I, uh, like Peter, I, th I think the unicellular state is an attractor. It's zero. Yeah, it is. It you is. Go, I think you're right. You I think you're right. Zero. I think it's anti-entropic. But it's not, it's not the only anti-entropic system, of course. And there are things that preceded it by many billions of years, of course. Anti because one of the big mysteries about the universe is that it is a very, very low entropic system. The entropy of the universe, as we observe it, is far lower than you'd expect it to be at a random point. It's a very low entropy system. But there are other anti-entropic things. One of them is the one, um, if I may be so bold, Peter, I mean, is your process as well of looking at the way that, um, that, that, that things, are, things are generated in terms of initial generation, not a big bang then, but a continuous process of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of communicating a zero energy across space and time and across the whole universe. That's anti-entropic as well. That's got a structure in there too. And when you say anti-entropic, I mean, it is anti-entropic locally, but in, on the whole, it's in highly entropic. Uh -huh. It's more entropic overall than, than yeah. anti-entropic. It's only anti-entropic locally. I'm talking about anti-entropy locally. That's what we observe. Any structure is yeah. anti-entropic, virtually any structure, except uh -huh. perhaps gravity, except what gravity does. But certainly all the other forces are anti-entropic if they create structures. Yeah. I, I think I probably think of it more strongly than you do then, because when I'm thinking about matter creation, I'm thinking about a, a strongly anti-entropic process in, 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 in the initial, well, a lo again, locally anti-entropic, because if you look at the whole system, um, it's at least neutral and probably a, a highly entropic. I mean, but, life generates a huge amount of entropy, a huge amount of entropy. Uh, so it, it, life isn't anti-entropic in that sense. Yes, but it generates a lot of entropy in forming order in itself. But the local structure. Local order is very ordered. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's, that's the way I'm looking at these things as well. But it's not just life that does that. It's also, for me, yeah. it's the creation of matter that's doing that as well. That's giving a local, a local reversal of, entro of entropy, a local ordering. So, um, so life's doing that and, and matter creation. And for that, I don't think you need a big, I, I hear what you're saying about the Big Bang, John, but I don't think you need the Big Bang per se, anything which has that process and that order and that implicit uh, and that ordering of things is going to give you something which is also, which has the same effect of that flow of energy through, well, the flow of time, energy, flow of energy, flow of time, same thing. I agree with John there, it doesn't have to be a Big Bang at all. Mm. Yeah. I got a question for John Williamson. You mentioned other things than life that are locally anti-entropic. Yes. Can you give me a few more examples? Well, the, the example is the existence of the universe, the creation of matter. So, so in the simplest form, that would be a big bang because the initial po point of the big bang, things of singularity is extremely anti-entropic. You're talking about something which has zero entropy. It's all localized at a singularity. Now, now any, any process which is creating matter, and clearly matter has been created at some point, hello everybody, um, is, 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 is doing that in some, in some local area. It doesn't have to be life for that. It can be the creation of hydrogen itself, which, okay, I mean, you could say that is life in a sense, but, 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 but it can be at a simpler level than, uh, than at life, that you have something which, it, which has this localized ordering effect. And the creation of matter is a very strong example of that. However that happened, so, so, so if you take that coming from a big bang and then everything flowing from a big bang, as, as John is suggesting, then yes, there's, there's, the, 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 there's a process by which that thing is playing out and that process has entropy as one of the strongest uh, drivers of that and one thing that you really wouldn't want to go against if you're thinking about thermodynamics is definitely something you don't want to try and work against. Um, but, but, but anything that's producing order in, 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 uh, in creating well, creating life or creating particles or creating a localized ordering or creating elementary or creating nuclei, creating 
nucleons from other nucleons and ordered, ordered nucleons is, is a local ordering of things that looked at as a whole system, the degree of disorder, the entropy may be increasing. But, but locally, we're talking about things which are, which are very ordering. You know, you have matter falling into a, in, into a, into a star, you have the ordering in, uh, in, uh, in planetary systems, you have the ordering of the galaxy. These are ordered systems. So something that Peter Marsh and I have long um, been examining is the possibility that these structures from at any level uh, uh, behave like a quantum Carnot engine. Mm -hmm. The Carnot engine is the most efficient possible engine and the, the, the local structures behave like quantum Carnot engines, we thought. Okay, that's a, that's a, nice, that's a nice analogy. <laughs> So, John, can I ask? Of any size, that's biological. And yeah. we've written a lot on that uh, mm -hmm. for a long time. And we've been talking about this thing, you know, since the late 90s. But, but we've also written a lot of papers and stuff on that. Mm -hmm. um, and also there's a section in Zero to Infinity on it. So, John, can I ask? A, so, the, re the reason I, that I focused on the Big Bang and the singularity, so I published a paper on the singularity of nature, and now we're publishing a book on this subject. And the reason that I that I focused on that is because the way I got to that voxel of the unicellular state was through this walking back, if you will, retrograde analysis. It's what Gould called exaptation or pre-adaptation. So any given evolutionary step has its uh, origins within the cell itself. If the cell doesn't make stuff up, it just reuses the yeah. same material over and over again. So once I got to the unicell, I thought, well, well, what's that referencing? So uh, Conrad Block uh, came up with the, the biosynthetic pathway for cholesterol. His idea was that there are, you need 11 atoms of oxygen to make one molecule of cholesterol. So therefore, ergo, there had to have been enough oxygen to make cholesterol, but that's backwards. I maintain that that's because there were lipids on those asteroids that you know, carried the uh, frozen water to the Earth's surface to form the ocean, and that in turn spontaneously form these micelles, which, which is a biochemical phenomenon that we w well recognize. But the point I'm trying to make is then the question was, why, if it's lipids that gave rise to these uh, micelles or, or uh, primitive prototypical cells, what is, the, what is the lipid referencing? And my thought was that the unicell, the cytoskeleton, the, the, the cell, the unicell, all cells have a cytoskeleton. And that cytoskeleton determines, is the determinant of whether the cell is either stable and homeostatic, mitotic or myto meiotic. So the cell itself is dictating its, sta its status. And so I thought, well, if, it's, if this is a, 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 what's it called, a, um, is the term for it I'm blanking on. Uh, the atom and the cell are both these- um, Self-recreating. Um, um, yeah, you know, these uni unities, there's a term for it yes. that I use in the paper I wrote. But anyway, I'm blanking yes. on it. But, but you know what I'm saying, that, yeah. that in, in fact, if the cell no, has self-reference and self-knowledge, and, yeah. and another idea that I sh I've shared with Mark is maybe it's a fractal of the, of the cosmos. So if it's self-knowing, then what is it knowing about? And I the only thing I could think of was the singularity that uh, preceded the... I have, there's a lot of steps before you get to the singularity. If we're talking about something which is self-referential, which, which is essentially self-recreating and which is persistent, then, then, then we're talking about something that has like a hard shell. Uh, Pascal would call it a hard carapace, I think. So, so, so you have something which has a boundary to it, uh, and and it, it, this is not from any particular physical or even mathematical theory that, we're talk that he's talking about. This it's it's simply from the idea of something which comes back on itself, which recreates itself, which is self-referential in the sense that it, that it comes back and comes back to its beginning and comes back to its beginning. It's topologically a torus. You're talking about something which flows, but then comes back into itself, and that has a boundary, which is formed by the fact of it flowing by its own dynamics. So, 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 um, so, a self-recreating thing like that, something which is self-referential like that, has a has a boundary, and it has persistence, and it has a periodicity, it has an oscillation, it has a, it's a wave. We have something which is which is which is which is alive in the sense that it's that it's dynamic, not, not necessarily that it can think about itself, but yet, but, but that it's a dynamical system, which is a self-recreating and a self-referential system. So, um, so yeah, I, I think going back to the Big Bang is, 
So the thing about the Big Bang is it can cover a multitude of sins because there's a whole period there where you know nothing, where physics itself isn't working. So um, I think you probably want to, if you're going, you know, going to sell to Big Bang, it's a big jump. There's, there's plenty of, I would go sell down to, down to molecule, down to atom, down to elementary particles. And then, okay, if you want to have a look at the origin of elementary particles, then, then we can agree to differ on where their possible origin comes from because I'm not a Big Bang follower either. But I don't think it really matters for what you're doing. What matters is that, there's a, is that there is a flow which is coming from simplicity to complexity and which has that, which has that ordering process in it. So, so, so I don't think, I, I see why you're making the jump and I think it's an inspired jump that you're making as well to think, okay, it, it doesn't just start here. There has to be some paradigm for that, which is a deeper paradigm. And uh, I, actually, I think what would be really good and I think that might help here is to have a look. Arnie Ben produced a very nice talk on patternings in nature, going down through the cell and going into intercellular systems, but then going up to universe through hurricanes, through through electromagnetic systems to solar systems and galaxies in one direction, then going down the other direction, down towards um, fractals, fractals indeed, and then going down to elementary particles. It might be inspiring to have a look at that. It's just an hour. It's up on one of the featured what? videos on Quisicle. Hey, can you have you got the link, John? Yeah, I can. I can put it, I'll put a link up on a chat box. Just a minute. I'll go and find it. Okay. I was going to say that elementary particles, by which I mean fermions, have yep. a desire to destroy themselves by connecting with the rest of the universe, which would zero them. Mm. And what they're trying to do is zero all the time. So they latch, that's why the electron latches onto the hydrogen atom, onto the proton and forms the hydrogen atom, because it's trying to find something that will cancel it. However, it never finds its complete opposite, because that complete opposite is completely everywhere else. That's right. So it finds partial opposites, and that's how complexity arises. I completely agree with that point of view. And I think that the thing is that what happened right in the beginning, when the initial, going back to John's initial proton and electron, is that, is, 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 is that that process where they were complete like that, where they had found their opposites, it was simply much more likely that from ent entropic principles that they come apart. So the whole universe is then just a much more likely way of expressing nothing at all. Through, through the fact that entropy happens and the thing then jumps out to give you, the, give you the universe that you have. And I think it's exactly right what you say, Peter. The thing is still looking to get back to that, but it can only ever do it partially. And, and it, it's that going to do it even, even yeah. when it's partially, that's not enough. No, no, no it's, never, it's much more, too molecule. complex, far too complex it's now. Become a lipid and the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's going, it's going in, in, in that direction of complexity and increasing complexity. And because part of that process is life, then. To do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's... It's essentially the weak interaction that does it. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. I remain to be convinced on that particular one, but... but, uh, but well, that's whether... fermion. Fermion's trying to find their, you know, their nemesis is the weak... I, I mean, for, for me, I think they're all the same interaction, the weak, strong, and electromagnetic. I think you do in a, in a way as well. So I wouldn't say it was just one of them, but okay. <laughs> but, um, John, can I, can I ask, um, when, we talk, when we think about the periodic table, we think in terms of periods and families and that kind of thing. Yeah. Is, is that what you're envisaging um, in this biological period, periodic table? I know you've got these numbers here. I mean, I, I don't know what... Oh, oh yeah, I, I think there is... I mean, as is related, a close friend of mine for years uh, when I lived in Baltimore, um, an astrophysicist, when I called him, he was at the Museum of Natural History. Um, he's the curator for astrophysics there. And I said, I ran this idea of a periodic table of biology. And the first and only question he asked was, oh, you mean there's valence in biology? Mm -hmm. Yes, there is valence. Um, and the valence is based upon those signaling mechanisms because there is a hierarchy there. The first, yeah. the first signaling mechanism that kicks in is the crosstalk between, so the zygote is like the, like the globe. And think of the, so there's the equator running around the zygote. Um, and it, it, it's the animal and vegetal poles of the zygote. There's crosstalk there already uh, through the bone morphogenetic protein signaling mechanism. And then it just progressively, as you go to two cells, four cells, 16, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, yeah. different, Fiber, uh, so fibroblast growth factor, epidermal growth factor, there's a whole litany of them. And I think that's where the valence comes from. 
it represents the plasticity, the ability, the reactivity of the cells and in a hierarchical, hierarchical fashion. So yes. So, I mean, and, and I can never remember whether it's periods or families, but the rows going across, that's periods, isn't it? Um, yes. um, um, how, how would that translate? Is that, is that, are you representing that vertically here? Um, I, I guess I would have to do the, the hard work of assigning a tag to every given key step and then see how that plays out. But I would okay. think, yes, it would be feasible. And would you see increasing levels of um, instability or, or uh, differences in stability and order? Um, and the, you know, I don't mean that, instability and instability as you move down or... There would be increasing stability. Yeah. There'd be increasing stability as you move down. And across. And I'm across. not sure. Uh, I, okay, I have to right. work, I'd have to work through that to yeah. see. Because, so, I mean, what I, one thing I didn't say was everything I've said about these, uh, the biologic um, premise is based upon scientific data. It's not, mm. it's not in, intuitive or inductive. <laughs> it's, it's based upon experimental evidence. So yeah. I hang my hat on that and I'm and I would have to find the data to support all that to yeah. see how well it would hold together but uh, Mark do you think there's any value in you know the stuff I was talking to you about more recently and I think in the last couple of days or even this morning about my real when I watched that bohm video yeah um and that whole it you know Krishnamurti's comment to bohm about the organ the observer and the observed my saying to you because it goes to what John was saying about um um, self-referential self-organization. That's very yeah. facile to say, but it's more difficult to provide the the how and wherefore of that. And I think that that's what Bohm talks about and what Krishnamurti is talking about in the sense that if the, if the cell is the fractal of the cosmos, then there yeah. is this, in the convergence of the conscious, consciousness in it with a small c and consciousness with a big c is observer and observed. They are become yeah. one and the same. And for example, I think that they explain why it is that when you try to measure the, the two slit experiment, it evaporates because you cannot do that. You cannot examine yourself. Yeah, but th so this I is like, helpful. I, I think I think this is language that's very close to Lou Kaufman. I think I think Lou is doing this stuff. I'm John. You you know Lou's work well. I'm yeah. Peter. No, I, I I think what 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 John's saying here is correct. I mean, if you have an elementary process. You have a single process, a process of communication between two things, it, intermediated by an elementary particle exchange by a single photon, then that exchange is completely private. Mm. It's completely private in the sense that it, it, it gets emitted from one place, it gets absorbed at one point. Nothing else in its universe makes any difference, it matters to that emission absorption event, to that elementary process event. So if, you, if, if some tricky human sticks a double slit in there, it goes through both slits because for it, the universe is exactly at the point of emission absorption. Mm -hmm. And if you're building up a universe from those kinds of things, that those are your elementary processes, your elementary processes are all at the same point in space time, then it's, an, it's, it's a universe which has that underlying characteristic as one of its basic things. So, so, so it's something one can then not get away from. It's this intimate connection between the emission and absorption events. And Bohm's talking about this too. Um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Lou as well, but even more so Garnet in, in some of the more recent talks, if you look at some of the things that, that Garnet's been having, having, having a look at. Um, and, 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 uh, and Peter as well, he hasn't given that talk yet, but I'm, he, he's promised to give it, where, 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 where the thing is, uh, where we're looking at a, a universal connection here. The reflection, he calls it a reflection, I call it an inversion. The reflection between an elementary particle and the rest of the universe, because the elementary particles having an interaction here, but then it's not sort of the only one. It's doing it all over the place, but each one is individual. So this is like we are all individuals. We're all at the same point in space time. Each one of us is at that point for the observer, and it's the observer which is unifying all of these things. They're all at the same point in space time, here and now, right now, mm. and, and that 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 then pulls the whole observable universe we call it observable universe but it's actually the whole interactable universe it is your universe is absolutely moment by moment at the pinnacle of your present where everything else is in your past in terms of things that affect you at that moment yeah. and that past can be universally large 
that past can go if we had if there was a big bang right back to the big bang that the, the, those effects are coming from for eight minutes ago for the sun four light years ago for alpha centauri uh, billions of years ago for faraway galaxies right down to 13.7 billion years ago for the edge of the universe so 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 your present is a, is a composite of all of those things as you the observer all this stuff coming in from different directions aren't you, aren't you creating time in this process I yes. mean, when, you, when we talk about we're creating we're making time aren't we we are at the pinnacle of time each each individual thing is everything in its in, it, everything is coming in from its past so it, it is the pinnacle, the absolute cutting point of forward moving time. And each, each one of us, each obs we're all observers, but each one, for each one of us, your time is, you know, where the hell are you at the moment? You're in Liverpool. What's that? That's, a, that's, a, that's quite a lot of nanoseconds ago for me. So what is it? It's a, th it's a thousand Ks roughly. So it's, it's about, a, you're about a millisecond ago, man. Oh shit! You know, yeah. I, I always know the millisecond behind. Passe now. Sorry, sorry, Peter. You're saying he's passe now. <laughs> oh, it has been. I mean, but well, your universe is different from mine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you guys are much closer together. I can see it in both of you. <laughs> I wonder whether I can ask a question here. Yes. Yeah. Um, and been thinking about uh, what you said about the self being self knowing um, and transposing this at the level of a human being. So I'm thinking of consciousness um, and the, the degree to which, uh, certainly, you know, you're talking about Krishnamurti, there's this notion of consciously being conscious. Um, or consciously conscious of being conscious, which is allegedly something to do with awakening. Um, and does that, it, it seems to me that human beings have lost the capacity uh, of being self-aware. So unlike the cell, then there's something when it, it's lots of cells, trillions of cells, that that, that, that self-knowing is somehow lost. And does that then create entropy if i'm correct as opposed to because more consciousness creates more order and then creates more structure therefore anti-entropy now i may be completely lost here but that that's the question that i'm putting to you to, to make a connection to what i understand of human beings um, and as human beings having their their own electromagnetic field uh, having their own torus um so question yeah, no, great question. And, and um, I guess to, to keep it constrained intellectually, I think of David Chalmers, hard, the hard problem. You know, why is it that we see red when we whack our, thing, our, our thumb? And I think that, so the key is that, as I was trying to explain, um, our, our physiology evolved from the endogenization of factors in the environment that, that posed an existential threat. Now, the, the most compelling argument for that is iron. Iron is a very potent oxidizing agent, but in, you know, the red cells in our, in our um, uh, circula circulatory system, they are essential for carrying oxygen, um, for example. And there are many, you know, every, every aspect of physiology, pretty much, once it's explained by the cell, it becomes, it's compartmentalized and becomes our physiology. My point is that, that those networks that start from the unicellular state and then culminate in the offspring, and then during maturation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that, that networking is still there. And uh, you were saying that we've lost that sense. Yes, but, so I make an argument, the argument that, uh, I argue for the central theory of biology, which is non-existent, that that actually derives from the uh, evolution of warm-bloodedness. Only birds and mammals are warm-blooded. Warm-bloodedness actually gives us the option of being much more interactive with the environment. I mean, you know, humans have gone into outer space. Birds can transit the, the poles, for example. So this is all about epigenetic inheritance, which my laboratory does in, at UCLA. But my point is that it hasn't been lost. If you, so the reason that I was, had the audacity to publish a paper with that premise was because I was playing my own devil's advocate. And I thought, well, if I'm right about this generation of heat, 
through stress, physiologic stress, and I won't bore you with the details, but my point being that, so the obverse should also be true. And then I realized, it dawned on me that the obverse of that process is meditation. So when we meditate, we actually go in the reverse direction. We begin to go from the higher centers here that have evolved through terminal addition, which is a principle in biology, it's an end addition, back to the, the gut brain, which is much less neurotic, if at all, I'm not sure, I, I, you know, because organisms that operate off a gut brain, you can't talk to them, but they seem more you know, comfortable in their own skin than I do. But my point being that, and, and the, that interrelationship is very interesting because the gut produces uh, hormones like leptin and ghrelin, which arborize the brain, the brain brain. So there's this phylogenetic developmental relationship, uh, if I'm making any sense here, that, yeah. that, yeah. that, that plays into what you're asking because we haven't lost the capacity. But, you know, yeah. so Krishnamurti says in this 1983 Brockwood conversation with Bohm, at the near the end of that conversation, he says that it is our ego that interrupts our ability to con commune with the cosmos. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I don't, yeah, I don't think it's a switch. It's a, it's a real step. Yeah, I, I'm just uh, trying to understand the process. But we are, to the extent that we're not meditating, I, I, you know, we are losing that, that what the capacity, the, what the cell naturally does, the self-knowledge. And there is a, but I don't believe we've lost it. And I think we can evidence. I think, well, I, think so, uh, I think the, I think the, there's a very big problem in the 21st century, in 2020. The problem is that, uh, that, 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 that awareness of awareness, that awareness of, of oneself, that, that awareness from the top down, right down through to the bottom, is now much harder to achieve than it once was. And the reason for that is our own uncertainty about mm. understanding the whole of what we know we've expanded that to such a huge extent and we've fragmented it to such a huge extent that coming down and getting a whole understanding of the whole of nature which flows through one from the universal down to the elementary is now much more difficult to achieve because of the uncertainty which we're generating in ourselves partly through such things as the uncertainty relation through things which we know that we don't know, through things which are axiomatically unknown now in quantum mechanics. Now, if one takes that on board, it then becomes very difficult holding that to meditate through that to the universe as a whole. So the very development that we're going through in terms of understanding more and more is working against, and what John said is exactly right now, things which are very, very simple, you know, the simple cabbage, see, 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 see see the happy moron he doesn't give a damn i wish i were a moron oh my oh, god yes i am and th 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 that simplicity is then lost unless one can regain gain the simplicity and complexity of understanding that complexity of, of encompassing that complexity otherwise one's left with a meditation which is a meditation into yes into 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 the into in, down into the the lower levels of the brain so so yeah, I, I'm, I was wondering whether um, it would be, I mean, to me, there's this notion of intuition that comes rather than going into the gut. I mean, it's maybe not either or, it's maybe both, but definitely the pituitary gland is associated yes. with intuition and that's associated with hormones. Uh, and there you can understand everything without having, through the com having to go through cognitive process. Yes, be cognizant of it. Yes, I think that's right. I think the, the, the intuition... The feeling that you have that something's going on, that, that something is the way it should be, that you just don't even feel in your fingertips, but then that grows and then comes into conviction and then into an understanding and then into a, an acceptance and then into something yeah. one can meditate on. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's the kind of process. But intuition is an incredibly, well, it's, it, it's the origin, isn't it, really? That's the no-brainer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Kristen, Kurt Kristen at the Wellcome Trust has shown mm -hmm. that during uh, rapid eye move, movement uh, sleep, they're actually, the brain actually cools in both humans and birds. And I'm convinced that that's very important because that's what is allowing for collection of epigenetic mark from the environment during the day. And at night, there's this sorting system by which the brain determines what to keep as memory and what to reject. 
So it goes to that issue. It's it's a proxy for intuition, I guess. It's it, it's the, not that thing. It's the long haul kind of thing. It's not just that the brain is freezing at that moment. Right. Right. Water um, inside the brain is freezing. Okay. So so because because it's in, there are very small capillaries in the brain, and they, they as you put water into a smaller and smaller um, capillary, its um, freezing point rises. So, and there are a lot of systems, so, so the brain temperature is such that, um, and the size of these capillaries is such that there's, there's an interface between frozen and liquid water in a large part of the brain. Some of the brain structure, I think, here is straight in the, in the liquid of the brain, in the water of the brain as well. So that, that slight reduction in temperature is taking you through a phase transition in parts of your brain. I think that's possibly important. Mm. But you can also, I, John, I do think you can habituate yourself to begin to come back into alignment with understanding what we're just talking about. Because, and the reason I say that is because I'm, if I'm right, and our physiology is really the network that interfaces with the cosmos, that the principle there is one of, um, the, the receptors are actually the ones that have evolved over, bio, uh, over evolutionary time. And you can train receptors to become more receptive by using them, oh, you know, this is the whole process by which we habituate. Um, so there, there are ways in which you can train yourself. Uh, I've talked to people who meditate and, and they've said to me, yes, it is easier and easier, progressively more, e easy, more e easier to get into a meditative state as you practice it. And that's not nearly, um, I mean, some of it sure is, you know, making sure that there, you know, the room is clear of stuff and that, you know, the housekeeping stuff, but, but the, the in, endogenous um, receptor mechanisms, we know that they can be trained. So with, with practice, you can just sink into it very quickly. Right. Yeah. So, yes, that's, that's certainly, yeah. Take. I think several of us obviously meditate. I meditate quite a lot. I'm also a yoga instructor, by the way. Um, and I, I would say that uh, well, the, the Buddha um, awake, got to his awakening by focusing on uh, observing bodily processes so really under, going back to the cellular the cellular self-knowing um, and be passionate I don't know if anyone knows it but it is about cellular reconnection uh, by observing so meditation that's a particular process of meditation I think that's exactly right one has to sink into realizing that, that, that the universe doesn't stop with oneself and that the whole universe is connected through one to the whole rest of the universe mm. and to everything and everybody else. Yeah. And that yeah. becomes more and more difficult, I think, for humans in the 21st century. So I've actually had a near-death experience um, on one of the freeways in California a decade ago. Uh -huh. um, I was pushed into the guardrail and the car flipped over. I was driving at the time and I thought I was in the back seat watching the whole thing like a cinema. It was all black and white. I had no fear. Um, and I basically, it was an out-of-body dissociative process, and, and I'm convinced that massive adrenaline can do that because it's it's it, it's synchronizing all the calcium waves in your body in a way where you know you're escaping. You know, it's the fight or flight mechanism in its in the extreme. But my point is that, uh, as you were saying, Vinka, that, um, that that the endocrine system actually is doing all so oxytocin, endorphins. You know, we know all these hormones are acting to create a, um, a wave collapse and coherence in, in quantum mechanical terms. And I think that that's real. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a great believer that, I mean, my intuition tells me that um, human technology is the most human, when I'm, when I'm talking about human, is the one that we, we are as human beings, our biological beings and whatever, you know, but also the electromagnetic field. So it's biological and physical. Um, but that is the most subtle of technologies. I mean, there, there's this something going on that we, we that we embody. That this technology is just amazing. Well, I've have gone on record to say so. Pleiotropy is a well-recognized phenomenon in biology. So, so you have crystalline the crystalline gene in your the lens of your eye that makes the the lens clear, and it also appears in your liver and other structures. So you have these constellations of genes that have evolved over time in our bodies. And when you're under stress, extreme stress, it, it creates an electrochemical field. We're actually creating a field, just like you would an electrical, electrical, electrochemical field in physics. It's the same thing. 
Yeah. And, and, and as I've said before, in Pauli exclusion pr principle is homologous with the first principles of physiology as I've mapped them out because both of them express both deterministic and probabilistic aspects. That's why it is that we can exist in this uh, a state of being um, in, in, a, in, a, in the physical world and, and uh, you know, we don't have to think about gravity. It just, you know, we have adapted to it. Um, so, and that goes, um, oh, I'm sorry, John. So my, my take on this is that, that the cell began in an ambiguous state. Uh, it was between negative entropy and positive entropy. And what happened historically was, um, so uh, Trivers is a well-known evolutionist who wrote a book in 2011, The Folly of Fools. He's saying that we deceive ourselves and others, and that's how we survive, Dece through deception and that the deceptive process is derailing the ability to understand that we actually began in an ambiguity, but we can actually, the, the kind of conversation we're having can make us realize, you know, that how it is that we actually have to comp contemplate our existence. We no longer have to deceive ourselves. We can be, we can accept these things as they, they present themselves because I think we have enough data to do that. And I think that's what we're doing here. Um. I'm, I'm very conscious that we've been going just over an hour and um, I don't know if people want to go on or um, it does seem to me that we started at the top of the table and we're gradually moving to our way towards the bottom, but there's a hell of a lot more to say about the bottom. Um, what do you think? I think one thing that strikes me about the bottom is that it's, um, it's language. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about um, the, the, this subject word object is English. Yeah. If if I think in Polish, then 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 it's a different structure. Sure. So it's the same sort of structure in Dutch, but or in French. But um, as you start moving towards Latin, or uh, then it's a different kind of structure. So 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 I think we're talking about the structure of language and then the structure of communication here. Mm -hmm. uh, so so education is communication in terms of a specific language. Mm -hmm. It seems to me. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Bob uh, Bob Hanning was in this group, and he, he bailed on us. He's a philosopher, and and in his last uh, Zoom, uh, he weeks back, he said that ideally the language should be all verbs. In other words, it's it's expressing the energetics of the cosmos because once you interject subject object, that's matter. So the matter is it's constraining the ver the, the verbs. I'm very interested in, in, in Bohm's idea here of the real mode as well, of this, uh, this mode where anything can be a verb or anything can be an adverb. <laughs> yes. I think that's a lovely yeah. idea. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, well, Rich, and, do you want to talk to that? You know, our conversation about Hebrew? Oh, um, yeah. Hebrew and Semitic languages in general, the, uh, the fundamental unit is the verb. And... Uh, Nouns are derived from verbs. So the Hebrew for boy is yelled, and that's a derivative from the verb, well, I got the verb form, but it means to bear. And a yelled is a male version of something that has been born. Mm -hmm. And we get that in English as well, I believe, with bairn, B A I R N, the child who has been born. Um, but the whole Hebrew structure, though, and I believe the whole Semitic language structure, is verbal in that sense. A friend of mine says that a noun in Hebrew is a verb that's moving very, very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the, the, the verb can carry a lot of meaning because it, it, with, the, with the endings, it can say who's doing what to whom, which direction it's moving in, what, to what it refers, at what kind of time it refers that, and, and, and in what kind of motion, in what kind of uh, relationship it, it observes that. So with the proper endings, you can do pretty much everything just with a verb and get all of the the rest of the things in there with all the different uh, right so ranges. that's making the conjugation and declension yep. in building um, various structures that you put on top of the verbs more important than the sequencing of different types of words yeah, and in, in, in Dutch for example I think in German too I, I'm not so familiar with German you, you have the possibility of stacking verbs yeah. so, so, so you don't have one verb in a sentence you might have seven yeah. Had and kunnen zijn geweest. Yeah. Had, could have, been, existed. Yeah, allebei. <laughs> yeah, allebei. Yeah, you've been ook a Nederlands spreker, of niet? Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it, different languages give you different structures of the way these things come together. But, but Japanese uh, doesn't conjugate verbs very much, as far as I understand. Interesting. So the indications would be minor in there. Yeah. In I think that in that context that we humans, I think as an as a, an analog of that or a corollary to that is that I've convinced myself that humans are the only organism that can contemplate past, present, and future simultaneously. And we know that we're mortal and that's what drives us nuts. But I think the conversation we're having in its extension will allow us to understand why that is and how that is. And so we can, we can uh, cope with it better. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, John. Um, Peter, is there a nilpotent structure to language? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. I'm not sure about that. We could look in, we could investigate that. Uh, what's your question? A no what? A, a nilpotent. So everything in, in Peter's work is about nothing. So it's about... Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I think there I, is... I've just, I've just written a paper about music being about nothing. No, I, there, I is, there is a nilpotent structure to language because... Mm -hmm. I know. Because the rewrite structure brings out nil potent, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I, th I think there is. Um, I mean, I, I'm very interested in silence. Is yeah. that, and the condition for language to exist is yeah. is clearly silence and music. Well, I think I think the very interesting thing in music is that um, the whole process seems to be driven by somehow the piece has got to finish. So you have to construct silence somehow. I know John's smiling. He's, but he's seen me talk about this. <laughs> well, but I, I've said to Mark that, I mean, I, I have a close friend from LA that uh, teaches uh, um, jazz classes. Um, and and uh, the thing that, uh, that caught my attention was he said that, and he was doing a whole thing on uh, jazz pianists. And he said that in, the, in that genre, that the pianists talk about playing between the cracks, the cracks, the spaces between the keys. So the real stuff is the silence, not the music. Yeah. And so I don't know if that's what you mean, Mark. Yeah, no, that's right. And I, I spoke to Elizabeth about this as well. Um, yeah. The most okay. important notes are the ones that are not played. They oh, famous jazz pianists. Lots of mentions of especially, it. Especially in Bach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lots of mentions. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to suggest that we, we wrap up for this week. I just think there's a huge amount to continue with uh, next week, particularly around, um, around education, language, consciousness, um, that stuff. Um, can, I just I, say, can I just say one thing for, for next week as well? Because it was, I was very interested in what was said about the Japanese language. But if you look at the Chinese written language, that has no words at all. It has a set of symbols which are which are juxtaposed and enable one to understand what is being said from the yeah. juxtaposition of those symbols. And again, in terms of education, I think that that is eventually the kind of thing that one is aiming for, is that, anyway. John, do you know um, Ezra Pound wrote a wonderful little book called The ABC of Reading. And <laughs> he starts by talking about um, Chinese writing. Beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful book. Um, so English is not my first language. I'm Hungarian. And so I think a lot of the way I think is because I know that there's more than one way to express myself or whether some idea, some symbol, some object, uh, it always has a dual, at least a duality. If yeah. not, you know, and I speak German and French as well. So I'm cognizant of the fact that the same thing or action can be sp expressed in different ways. And so you're always doing this sort of compare and contrast kind of thing in your head, or I am anyway. So, yeah. yeah. To the feeling. Uh, and Hungarian is a language I would love to learn. <laughs> a bit late now, but... Uh... <laughs> Related to Martian. <laughs> Kesto said we were, we were Finnish and Turkish, I think. <laughs> yeah. Three weird languages. <laughs> yeah, it's the Finno ugric uh, family, and apparently over time, I mean, it used to be it was only just oh, Hungarian yeah. and Finnish, but now it turns out to be all kinds of derivatives of that language you know as the you know as Genghis Khan marched across the, <laughs> the mm -hmm. you know, Eastern Europe and or um, Asia and then he just sort of you know picked mm -hmm. stuff up or threw it away or whatever yeah <laughs>
All right. Is there anybody who, who wants to ask a quick question before we before we go? I will post up the video of this meeting in the ridiculously long email now that I'm sending around to everybody and put it in the Google Doc. Um, okay. Well, thank you, Mark, for organizing this. It's all right. I, I sit in some terrible Zoom meetings, so this is always a pleasure. <laughs> 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 yeah, thanks a lot, Mark. Mark, um, we, we've been trying to get together and talk for a week yes. and failing. Yes. Um, I don't know whether we can arrange something. If well, you're and tomorrow? Now, if you're free in the, an hour or for the next hour. I'm free I in do. an hour. Yeah, I am actually. Let's get, yeah, let's talk. Okay, good. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, let's oh, do it. Okay. I, right. that, I, I, I put a uh, Marguerite uh, painting in the, yes. in, which I, I find. I mean, to me, it's interesting that it actually is a, rep I think it's a representation of observer and observed from a great perspective. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's been, it's been really wonderful today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll see you next week. Good to, good to meet some new people. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. yeah. Good Thanks, guys. John, John yep. Williamson. Yes. You got my invitation. I did. Yeah, Peter, I've already started working on it. Good for you. Oh, no, you're going to reply to me, are you?